The torts question from July of 2009 turns out to be a little easier than it looks. Have a look at the call of the question. 1. Did the court correctly grant David's motion to dismiss on the grounds stated? Discuss. Well, this could just as easily be a civil procedure call of the question than a torts one. We will obviously have to read the fact pattern to figure out what's going on. But, certainly, David is going to be our defendant. He has successfully moved to dismiss a lawsuit filed by the plaintiff. Obviously, our plaintiff is going to have to have had a theory of liability and a prayer for relief. But our defendant, David, is the victor. The court granted his motion to dismiss, and the first call of the question tells us what grounds were used to justify that decision. So, at a minimum, we're going to be discussing those two ideas. But it's likely we're also going to need to get into the plaintiff's theory of liability, whatever that turns out to be. Now look at the second call of the question. What is the likely outcome of David's suit for malicious prosecution against Patty and Art? Discuss. Well, we don't know who Art is, but Patty is likely to be the plaintiff. Maybe Art is a co-plaintiff in the earlier action. So as we read this call of the question for the very first time, we think about two lawsuits, David versus Patty and David versus Art. We know that his theory of liability is going to be malicious prosecution, and the elements of that may flash through our minds. The, we also know that David probably is going to be seeking damages, and if he's successful in establishing a claim for malicious prosecution, our plaintiff would be entitled to both compensatory and punitive damages. So the basic analytical pattern of what's going on in the litigation is, for some reason, Patty sued David. David filed a motion to dismiss, and he won, and then, as a result, he filed a malicious prosecution action against Patty and Art, whoever Art is. And so we're likely to have to judge elements of the theory of liability, and the prayer for relief is likely to be damages. It's unlikely to be a complicated part of the question. Go to the top of the fact pattern, and we meet Patty, our plaintiff in the underlying action. She is in the business of transporting human organs for transplant. She only gets paid when there is a successful timely delivery, and so a delay can make the job worthless to her. David transports gasoline over long distances in a tank truck. David is our successful mover to dismiss. He's also our plaintiff in the second call of the question. In paragraph two, we find out that recently he's hauling gasoline through city, he's crossing a bridge in city, his truck skidded on an oily patch and became wedged across the highway, blocking all traffic in both directions for two hours. Okay, has David done anything wrong here? Answer? None that we can see. If he was driving this truck somewhere where the truck is not supposed to be, that might be a source of liability. But as it turns out, based on all we know right now, he wasn't responsible for making the road slippery. And as a result, it doesn't seem likely that David has done anything wrong. In paragraph three, we see Patty trying to deliver a kidney, but getting stuck behind David on this bridge right when the accident happened. So as a result, Patty suffers $1,000 in damages. Now have a look at paragraph four. We find out that Art is a lawyer. He's contacted by Patty. She says she wants to sue David for the $1,000. She says there's not a lot of money involved, but I want to teach David a lesson. David can't possibly afford the legal fees to defend this case, so maybe we can put him out of business. Now, can you see even the slightest shred of good faith on Patty's part? I can't. Take a look at paragraph 5. Art agrees, but he concludes that he can't prove negligence against David. Look at what happens next. We're told that Art decides that the only possible claim Patty's got is one based on strict liability for ultra-hazardous activity. And so he files a suit based on that theory against David on behalf of Patty. And what he wants is damages to cover the $1,000 fee. And we get the facts recited in the first three paragraphs of our essay question appearing on the complaint. David files a motion to dismiss, and the court grants that motion on the grounds that the complaint failed to state a, a cause of action, and that, in any event, the damages alleged were not recoverable, and enter judgment in David's favor. And then we get the call of the question once again. Well, this is kind of an interesting fact pattern. It certainly seems as if, in the people in this pattern, David's the nicest guy in the group. 
but it isn't hard to organize our thinking around an answer to this question. Have a look at the outline of issues that I've written. Notice that in my heading, I lead with the conclusion. I write, the court correctly granted David's motion to dismiss on the ground stated. My heading is a direct answer to the call of the question. But in order to explain that answer, I have to go into the elements of strict liability, which I do piece by piece. Here again, I'm not doing anything innovative here, but I am being consistent in following my approach. Then I focus specifically on damages, which is necessary because we've got a holding by the judge that even if this plaintiff did have a valid theory of liability, the plaintiff wasn't going to be entitled to recover damages. Then we reach a conclusion. Turning to an outline of issues for the second call of the question, again, my heading is a direct answer to the question. David sued for malicious prosecution against Patty and Art. And this suit is likely to succeed. Now, you remember when we first looked at the call of the question, my initial reaction was, we'll have two separate lawsuits, David versus Patty and David versus Art. But as it turns out, his claim against both of them is identical. But notice, within my analysis in section two, I basically am focusing on the key element of malicious prosecution, the fact that David won a final judgment on the merits. Then, in separate sections, I focus on each of the defendants, Patty and Art. I suppose one could have done a separate lawsuit for each of these two defendants, but it seemed to me easier to focus on them this way. You'll notice that in my headings, again, I'm focusing on the key facts. Patty had a personal vendetta against David, and Art had an ethical duty to ex exercise independent legal judgment. And you already know that my conclusion is that David is going to win. Now let's have a look together at my model answer to this essay question. This is a model answer which covers the ground in, I think, a very workmanlike fashion. You'll see that I do everything I can to, to turn this essay question into a series of short answers. Have a look at my answer to question one. Look at what I do. I lead with the facts. I start off by explaining who the parties are and what the procedural status of the case is. Then I go into strict liability. And you'll notice that I define strict liability in about the most compact way possible, and then I go into an element-by-element element analysis. Now, it's true that transporting gasoline may well be an ultra-hazardous activity, but not when it is involved in a mere traffic accident that has nothing to do with the cargo being transported. And so, Patty's claim fails because although she can establish but-for causation, the accident had nothing to do with the ultra-hazardous nature of the cargo. So, as a result, the facts that Patty alleges don't add up to a, a showing that her harm has been caused by anything having to do with David's conduct other than the fact that he was driving this vehicle. So I conclude that Patty's lawsuit doesn't state a claim for strict liability and that the court correctly granted the defense motion to dismiss. Then I turn to damages. And here, we need to really focus in some depth on exactly what we have been told in the fact pattern. Remember, we've been told that the judge granted the motion to dismiss and also said that even if the plaintiff had stated a valid theory of liability, she wouldn't be entitled to damages. Well, that's where the judge almost certainly got it wrong. And you'll see in the two paragraphs that I devote to a consideration of damages, I indicate that the defense that the judge apparently bought to damages, independent of the defense to the theory of liability, is that Patty is alleging pure economic harm in the absence of any personal injuries. Now, that might be a valid defense to negligence, but it is a significantly thinner defense to strict liability. And it seems to me that if Patty, in fact, had been able to establish a strict liability claim, she should be able to recover these damages. But that decision on my part is no help to Patty, because I conclude that the court was right in stating that she didn't even manage to state a theory of liability. Now, you'll notice that the, at the end of my answer to the first call of the question, I've written about a page and a half. And I have only about one page of content to say about the second 
question that's been presented by this essay question. I think question one really is significantly harder and more complicated. But you'll notice in my answer to question two, once again I lead with the facts. I explain the procedural status of the case and, very briefly, I define what the plaintiff is going to have to do in order to establish malicious prosecution. Basically, I define it. Then I go into the facts about Patty in Section A and the facts about Art in Section B. Now, it seems to me that this is not really a PR question, but we've got an attorney who is misbehaving, and under the circumstances, it seems to me that Art has failed up to live up to his, he's failed to, li to uh, exercise independent legal judgment. Look into my analysis for both Patty and for Art, and you'll see I am able to work a lot of law and facts into those relatively compact sections. Ultimately, I find that David won the underlying action, and I conclude that David's malicious prosecution suit against Patty and Art is likely to succeed. And as a result, our plaintiff, David, should win compensatory and punitive damages from both of the defendants. And that wraps up a consideration of what I think you'll agree is a legally fairly simple, but analytically a fairly complicated torts fact pattern.